Welcome back to another session of Healing School. I'm Pastor Marcus, and like I said before, um, welcome to another anointed session of Healing School. We're coming at you from Words of Life Fellowship Church, where we do believe in miracles. We do believe in signs and wonders, following the word, and following every word that I'm saying here this, the, today. I thank God right now for continuing to open the eyes of our understanding by the spirit of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding so we can know. When I say know, is become one with this knowledge that's being ex we're being exposed to. And what are the riches in the glory? Oh, my goodness. Thank you, Lord. And I thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus for every word that I speak. Every, be, let it be anointed coming out of my mouth and let me speak with clarity, Lord to bring this message forth with clarity and boldness. And all those that are hearing are hearing with clarity. And I thank you, Father. <clears throat> it is the anointing. And the anointing alone that destroys the yokes and removes the burdens. And that's what Jesus came to do. <clears throat> we left off um, talking about going back to a different uh, translation of Matthew 27. But, you know... I want to stop here for a moment because it's so, it's so easy to, um, my, myself personally, I, I mean, I, I'm going to tell you right now, I, I did some things that only God saw, and it's between me and him. And those things that I did could put a hindrance or block me from being able to receive unconditional love when the things that I did, because of my past background in in um, the profession that I lived in, smuggling and uh, dealing in dope and selling and stuff. I, you know, basically what I was doing, I was not only ruining my life, but I was ruining people's lives too. I was literally dealing death. Think about it for a moment. I was a drug dealer, a drug smuggler. I ended up in prison. So everything was against me. But the beauty about it was that when I, went, when I went to prison, and I said this in the last time, but I want, to, I want to bring it back. When I went to prison and they took away even that last thing that I identified with that gave me a sense of worth because they took away my money, they took away my boats, they took away my bling, they put you in prison, and what, it, what happened to me was when the bottom fell out was when they took away my name. That's the only thing I identified with. And you and I are usually, what we identify with is what we yield to. And what we yield to is who we become servants to. That's why the renewing of the mind is so vital. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. It is God and God alone who can renew your mind. Well, actually, we renew our minds, but it's the presenting and offering ourselves to God for the purpose of not being conformed to this age, but being transformation, transformed by the renewing of the mind so we can walk and accept ourselves as God sees us only, only how God sees us. Beloved, now we are the sons of God. But I thank God that I, um, that he was able to break through because uh, it's amazing. When I, when I was in prison, I remember when, when all that happened and they called me by a number, that's when, like I said, the bottom fell out. And I, I really, for all practical purposes, like I'm telling you, identification, I, everything that I identified with as to who I was was the last thing I was holding to was that name. And once that was gone, I literally had an identity crisis. I literally did at 29, some to 30 years old. I literally had it because everything that I identified with that gave me worth was according to what I did. That's why I said that, that doesn't qualify or disqualify you according to what God, how God sees you. What you do does not determine what God did or how he loves you. But, that, but the, what happened is since I was having an identity crisis, that's when the Spirit of the Lord was able to swoop in and said, what was that? Joan Rivers, can we talk? I said, I'm ready. And I remember, beloved, listen to me. I remember the first time, thank you, Lord, that I heard him call me son. He called me son. He didn't call me Marcus. That's my natural name. That's the name they gave me on this earth. He called me son. And from that, from those words that he deposited in me, my whole ministry and my whole life was a, a result of that voice or those words 
that was deposited in me, the deposit he made in me through those three simple little letters, son, was what took me up out of the ground and prison didn't do me. Now, I was in prison, but prison was not in me. Like we could leave Egypt, but Egypt could still be in you. I was in it, but not of it. And that's what identifying with what God has done. We can live in this world, but we're, we're not of this world. We don't, we were, we're in it, but not of its system. We have been delivered from the power of darkness. We have been translated. The devil has been defeated, stripped of all his power. And that blood brought us back to innocence, 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 innocence. That's when I started seeing and be able to receive all that God has for me because he claims me innocent. So we go back to Matthew um, eleven twenty seven in the Passion. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And it says, you have entrusted me with all that you are, all that you have, or all things are delivered unto me by the Father. I added that. But no one fully or intimately knows the Son except the Father, and no one fully and intimately knows the Father except the Son. I want to I want to demonstrate something here. Um, we could. Did you have? Yeah. He's entrusted me. That's you. He's entrusted you because if any man be in Christ, you have a whole new birthright. You have a whole new lineage. You are born from above. You're not of this world. For he that comes from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaks the language of the earth. But um, uh, John 3 it says, uh, he that comes from above is above all. And he speaks what he hears and what he sees. And here we're hearing Jesus telling us what he hears, what he sees, what he's experiencing. Because he's abiding in the love of God. You have entrusted me with all that you are and all that you have. What is man? We can go there. <laughs> what is man? No one fully and intimately knows the son except the father. No one fully intimately knows the father except the son. Except the son. But you see, what we're doing there is Jesus is coming to unveil to us that which he is living in. It says, but the father or the love of a father that Jesus abides in, lives in, and he was sent to expose, restore, reunite, and demonstrate that love to us. Romans 5, verse 6, in the Passion. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. It says, for when the time was right, this is Romans Chapter 5, verse 6 in the Passion. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. See, this, this is demonstrating his love again. For when the time was right, the anointed one came and died to demonstrate his love for sinners. Now listen to the rest of this. For his love for sinners who were entirely helpless, weak, and powerless to save themselves. Can you redeem yourself? Can you heal yourself? Can you save yourself? Now, let me stop there for a moment. We take, in, in the, we take for granted that, yeah, we're saved. But why do we compartmentalize God and not see that salvation encompasses everything? The blessing of the Lord that makes us rich. Don't you know that it is God that gives you the power? Remember the Lord that he is it's God who gives you the power to get wealth, to establish his covenant. Don't you realize that all of it, every bit of it, it says it right there. We were hopeless, totally, entirely hopeless. And that's where I was, and that's where many of us were, are or have been. But don't stay there. There's a hope that was said before. The book of Hebrews chapter 6, we don't have to go there. But it says, hey, God willing more abundantly show to the heirs of salvation. The immutability of his counsel confirmed it with an oath. That by two immutable things, it was impossible to lie. God was impossible to lie. He swore by himself. But you know what? I can stop right there and say, well, wait a second. What if I don't know this God that I'm demonstrating to you, the love that he has for you? What if I don't know him? How can I believe that he was willing more abundantly to show to the heirs of the promise, the immutability of his counsel, confirm it with an oath? What's an oath from somebody I don't know? That's why revelation 
That's why Jesus is exposing us to the love that he is walking in. Listen, when he went to the cross, he knew that he had to abandon himself to the very love of God. He, worked by, he walked by faith just like you and I did, are doing and are learning to do. Redefining what we call faith. For when the, when the time was right, boy, that is so powerful. So see, we cannot save ourselves. I'm going back to compartmentalizing. Why is it so easy? I remember I've, I've heard Pastor Jerry say this before and I almost jumped up. I said, why? Why do, is it so easy for us to accept that we're going to heaven? Because you know what? It's out of sight, out of mind. But living for, or, or being able to experience this love in our helpless state and our powerless and our weakness to be able to know that it is God who is at work in us to will and to do. That he so loved us that he gave his son. The purpose of it was to reunite us. Make us, put us back in the family. Like I said, the vineyard in chapter 15 of the book of John is such a beautiful picture. And so is um, the, the book of Solomon when it starts talking about the bride and, and the bride and how, how they look for each other. There's, there's an expectation because there's a love affair. It's not a ritual. So you see, I, I, if I don't attend to his word, and, and listen to me, I'm not saying you have to, because I, I, just, I, I like to take those words out of my vocabulary. You have to. Because once I say that, I'm putting the burden on you. Jesus says, because you love me. See, do you, do you see the difference? Because you love me, you will keep my word. Ha! That's why I do it. That's because I love him, not because I have to. The moment you say, I have to, you're just going at it from a different perspective. You're just basically, what you're doing is you're getting a three-day pass to the kingdom. Just like you would go to Disney World, get a three-day pass, you go in and you come out. You get what you think you need and you come out. So you're living here and you're living there. You're in it but not of it. Okay, let's keep going. What I'm saying is don't disqualify the whole salvation man. And healing is what we're here for. Healing school, we were major on it. But I'm coming up a different side of the mountain because to establish ourselves in love, the love that doesn't fail, then I can start emptying my, the bags of weight that I'm carrying. What Jesus says in the very, um, I think, 20 to, um, 29th verse of, that, of Matthew, where he says, you overburdened, you heavy laid, you got those bags, you got your backpack full and you're carrying bags of heavy load. He says, come unto me. Learn of me, and that's what we're doing. We're learning the intimate relationship that he has with the Father so we can release ourselves as he's revealing himself to us, not by might or by power, but by his spirit. Because I asked you before, how can you believe something you don't see? By faith, we understand. <laughs> Listen, we've been justified by faith. Why are we going to stop there? By faith, we understand that the world's the cosmos, the whole creation, everything that we can see, the whole creation was framed by the word of God. So we're going to start framing our realities by the word of God. The worlds were framed by the word of God so the things that are seen did not come from things which do appear. So where are we going? We're going into it, which we'll do it next, next um, session. We're going to start do, going a little deeper, deep calling unto deep. And we're going to start seeing that, redefining what we actually, our core beliefs, because that's what we're establishing here, reestablishing, redefining what it is that we're learning how to intimately live with and in the presence of God and learning how to live in union with the triune God, as Jesus did. They're three, but they're one. Hallelujah. Um, Let's go to John 15, 13, and 15. John 15, 13, and 15, and regular King James, please. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Now, we're talking about love, right? And we're talking about a love that has no conditions. And this is God demonstrating his love to you and to me. So we can see and abandon ourselves to this blessed love. Abandon ourselves and unpack. So this is John 15, 13 and 15. It says, greater love has no man. Mm, mm, mm. Greater love has no man. Man. 
than this. Praise God. That a man would lay down his life for his friends. See, but he doesn't call you friends anymore. Verse 15 says, For henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant does not know what his Lord does. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my father, I have made known unto you. Now, listen to me. The word friends, if you look back at the... At, um, at Abraham's relationship with God, he's called God's friend. <laughs> and that means covenant language. That's what he's talking about right there. You're no longer a servant, uh, but I'm laying down my life for my covenant partner. That's what he's saying right there. Now, I'm, I'm going to go back. And let's go to um, John. Let me see. I was in 13. Let's go to 10, 15, 10. King James, and it's talking about what, what I was relating to just a minute ago as to doing something out of necessity or out of love. I'll give you an example. I made vows with my wife. We looked at each other and we said vows. We swore everything that we would look. But you know what? It wasn't those vows that keep me from doing anything outside of our marriage. You know what it is? It's the love that I have for her that constrains me. It's the love that we have for the word and for God and how he's revealing himself to us, the love that he has for us, that he was willing to lay down his life for his friend that we need to understand and be able to um, allow to develop, to live in us, to know it, that it is present living in us. Here it is right here. John 15, 10, King James. It says, if you keep my commandments. See, watch that. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. Now, see, that's not saying you better keep my commandments. That's not what that's saying. He says, let's, let's switch it around. If you love me, you will keep my word. If you keep my word, you're abiding in my love. You're showing me that the love that you have. And it's not I have to, it's I want to. I'm in love. I've learned to receive your loves, so now I'm, re I'm releasing your love back to you. I've kept, and, it's, and this is Jesus saying, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Listen, we're, we're sitting, we're abiding, we're living in. Now watch this. Let, let me do a play on words. I live Jesus is saying, I'm living, I'm abiding in. Do you see that word right there? I'm abiding in love. I'm, I'm in it. I'm not around it. It's, I'm actually in the love of God. Do you guys see what I'm saying? Oh, hallelujah. So this love is present and alive, and it's in us right now. We know him. Romans 5.5, 5, please. In the, um, and the, amp, in the uh, passion. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. We're doing pretty good. Hallelujah. Romans 5, 5 in the Passion. Now, this is talking about abiding in love and love abiding in us. Look at this. Mm. And this is a hope. It is... And this hope is not a disappointing fantasy. It's not a fallacy. It's not a fantasy. Because we can now experience the endless love of God cascading in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. How does, how does that love abide in our hearts? How is it? By the Holy Spirit, which lives in you. It's not by might or power. It's the, he's the one that Jesus, if we get to it today, we're going to see that Jesus prayed to the Father in 14 chapter of the book of John. He says, Father, I'm going to ask the Father to send you another helper. Another helper, which is the Holy Ghost, which is the spirit of holiness that proceeds from the Father. That love is now living inside of you. And once we know that love, that's, we're actually living inside of us. And we're experiencing this love. We know it. We commune with it. It talks back to us. It lets me know that I'm his own. And he walks with me and he talks with me. Simple little song, right? And he tells me I am his own. And the things we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. 
See, what this is doing is this a communication of your faith. By the acknowledgement, becomes effectual by the acknowledgement of every good thing that is in you. Love is cascaded in my heart now by the Holy Ghost. It's living in me. It's living in you. It's testifying to you. It's talking to you. It's constantly giving a testimony that, yes, you are the accepted. Yes, you are the beloved. Yes, I chose you out before the foundations of the world. I accepted you in the beloved and call you holy. It says that we should live to the praise of the glory of his grace where he has abounded toward us. Now, see, the love cascading into our hearts. Why? Because he chose in us. He chose us and took us out of the world. I want to stop there a moment because it is supernatural. It is supernatural, but I want to go back to demonstrating the union and the communion and the love that, that was operating in Jesus' life as he went and healed and making a declaration that nothing that he did was independent of the Father. I want to go to um, John 5, verse 6 of the Passion. And we'll stay in the, um, in the book of John, but just change translations in a moment. This is so good. John 5, 6. I want to stop for a moment. Okay, here we go. Now watch this. It says, when Jesus saw him lying there, he knew that the man had been crippled for a long time. So Jesus said to him, do you truly long to be healed? Now, wow. What a question. If you're racked with pain late night, now, would that be a question? This man, listen, he had been laying there. Jesus saw him laying there. He had knew that this man had been crippled for a long time. But watch this. This was a side note that came from that scripture. And it can say it like this when it says, do you really truly long to be healed? And it says, and this is what the side note said, are you convinced that you're already made whole. In other words, Jesus is saying, because once he sees Jesus, that's it. The word became flesh. Once he sees him, he says, are you really convinced that you're already made whole? The Greek phrase, genesithia, which I probably butchered, is actually not a future tense. What he's saying to the man, want to be healed? But in, um, but in the middle infinitive that indicates something that has already been accomplished because Jesus is asking the crippled, listen to this, he's asking the crippled man, if he is ready, oh Lord, this is so good, listen to me. He's asking the man, he says, Jesus is asking the crippled man, if he's ready to abandon how he sees himself and no longer, and, and how he sees himself and now receive the faith for his healing. Did you hear that? That's what it actually, what Jesus was saying to this man. Jesus was actually asking the crippled man if he is ready to abandon how he sees himself. Are you ready to abandon well, how you see yourself? What is your reality? Because you know what? Remember, we have been schooled in the curse. The purpose for renewing our minds is so that we can know, prove the will of God to allow God to be at work by the offering of ourselves, our bodies to him, presenting ourselves to him as a living sacrifice, which is our re reasonable service of worship. He's saying for the purpose of renewing your mind so you can come to the place where you don't see yourself as that disease belonging to you. Because at one time, according to Ephesians 2, 2, and you don't have to go there. According to Ephesians 2, it says, in times past, we walked. Our lifestyle was according to the course of this corrupt, fallen state world. We walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the children of disobedience, fulfilling the lust of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. In other words, watch this. We were born into a curse and corruption, and we were schooled in the curse and corruption, as belonging to you. That was par, of, par for the course. You were born in the earth, and that's the curse. That's the death sentence. But we will see that the death has already been defeated. 
Death has taken a blow, according to Colossians. But we're not going there now. What we're going is there, are you ready? That, I love that when I read that. It says, are you ready to abandon how you see yourself? What is your reality? What has been formulated in you? Because according again, as a man thinks in his heart, that's how he is. You can't escape it. Quality and quantity of the life that you now live in is a result of how you perceive yourself to be. That's why when, I, when the beginning, when I was reading, it says that things that were assumed, even in our environment, become a part of our lives' experiences. What we saw and what we didn't see are part of our accepted body of information that makes up the sense of what is possible and possible or what is real and the patterns that we have taken to accept that which belongs to us. If Jesus says to you, Father, let them know that they are no longer of this world as I am no longer of this world. You've been delivered from the power of darkness. You have been translated. There's been a move from here, a translation to here. You're no longer over there. But in this, in the, and the beauty of it is that you have also been made. Not only have you been translated into the kingdom of God's dear son of his love, but you have been transformed. You're being transformed. Your mind is being renewed so that your new reality can be formulated just like the worlds were framed by the word of God so the things that are seen did not come from things which do appear. The things that are going to start appearing to you are not going to be from things that do appear. In other words, the framing of your reality is not going to come from things which do appear because we have been, we have come. There's been a paradigm shift. And the reason I'm going by way of love coming up a different side of the mountain is so we can accept that which God is getting ready to unload on us because it's too big and you could disqualify yourself when you start looking to yourself as Moses did and Jeremiah. And I personally did it myself when we do it all the time. We disqualify God and we compartmentalize God. Yes, he can. No, he can. Uh, he might do this. He might do that. Listen, we need to restructure our core beliefs and what it is that we have allowed to be formulated. The word of God is a creative, has a creative power in it to reproduce after its own kind. I want to stop here and give you a quick little testimony while I still have the time. Um, I was looking at this... Um, on, on YouTube at this, um, these messages from Azusa Street. Man, it was so powerful. There was um, this, one, this one that I was looking at is called Growing Body Parts. Do you remember when um, God came to Ezekiel and he took him to the Valley of Dead Bones and he looked around and he said, Ezekiel, can these dead bones live? Ezekiel said, Lord, you know. And what did God tell him? He said, prophesy. Prophesy to the bones. We're going to prophesy to our lives. But it's not going to be to try to get something to come to us. It's going to be, a, uh, we're going to prophesy out of what we know is living in us. The love of God that's been shed abroad in our hearts and the glory of the Lord that lives, that passes understanding. Both those are living inside of us and those are the creative power. That's the power that he used, the glory is the power that God used to raise you and me from the dead. We were baptized into his death and we were raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. And that's where we're pointing, the Father. But going back to this testimony, he said, can, can these dead bones live, Ezekiel? He said, you know, Lord, he said, prophesy to him. And when he started prophesying, you know the story, bam, bam, tee, tee, things started snapping, right? And bones started growing. I mean, uh, sinews started growing, and ligaments and, and flesh and bone. Well, this is what took place in this Azusa Street testimony. They said they prayed. They were praying for this man who would come up. And he had, uh, he'd had an accident where he worked. And um, a construction. And his old left arm was completely severed. He had nothing there but a stub. And they... They were praying. They were having a prayer meeting, and they were praying for him, and they laid hands on him. One way, not the only way to get healed, um, the method that God uses. And they laid hands on him, and she said once they did, prophesied over this man, laid hands on him, she said they stood there, and just like in the, that's what it reminded me when I started listening to it. 
Just like in the book of Ezekiel, when the bones start snapping and the ligaments start growing and bone connecting the bone and flesh coming up, that's exactly what happened. She said they were standing there and the bone, a piece of bone would come out and then the skin would come follow after it and the, the sinew and the meat would follow after it and then another piece of bone would come out and the meat and the muscles and the bone would come and wrap itself around it till it reached the fingers and he had a full active, growing, living arm that grew right before them in the very presence of them standing there. Can I hear somebody say, thank you, Lord. You see, we're going to take the limitations off God. We're going to stop disqualifying God and ourselves. We're going to take the borders off and redefine what is possible as far as God is concerned. To learn to listen to his voice, become more intimate with the voice of the word, so we can bring a transition, take us out of this mortal mentality and deliver us from this bottom feeding idea and take us and elevate us and put us in a place where we have been called to sit. He prepared a table and he prepared a seat. Once somebody is sitting, boy, I tell you, cool cut up my So in the book of Ephesians, it says that we were made to sit. That's a place of authority. That's a place of a finished work. That's where it's already been completed. And these people activated and actually called on the very um, uh, creative power of God that is in his word and called forth for bones and muscles and fingers to grow. And what is the difference from them and us? The capacity we have to believe that these things are possible. Jesus, did Jesus not say, all things are possible. All things are possible. I'll give you an example of the possibility of all things. When God came to, um, to the Tower of Babel, and they were all of one voice and one accord. They were all saying the same thing. They were harmonizing. They were talking to each other. And God had to come down. He said, let us go down and see this tower. Now, I don't know if you know, but the tower wasn't built. They were still building mortar and brick and slime. They were still on the ground. But God said, let us go down and see the tower. Why would he go see the tower when they're still on the ground? Because the tower was already erected in their hearts. That thing was coming up. That thing was real. That's what I'm talking about. This word of God, living, active, sharper than a two-edged sword, able to, um, to just absolutely... Uh, cut us under the, this, this, the, 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 the difference, the spirit, the soul, and the marrow of the body, and actually as the discerner of the intents of the heart. This is what I'm talking about. It's not by might. It's not by power. It's by the spirit of God taking us out of this little box that we, of limitations that we could say, well, it, ha it can't happen because I haven't seen it or I haven't seen it. We've seen it. We know it. And that's what I'm talking about. This gospel is not after man. We did not receive it from a man. But it's by direct revelation that gives us insight into what God is willing to do. The creative power in the word of God by itself able to reproduce after its own kind and bring life, health, bones, healing, restoration and make us whole. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, this day that you have made. I thank God right now that he's making all this real, bringing you to a place where, where hope, there's a hope that is set before you. It goes beyond the veil that God gave us this hope. He says, by the mutability of his counsel, he confirmed it with an oath so we could have a strong consolation to lay a hold of the hope that goes beyond the veil that anchors the soul. We're moving in the right direction. We're going up, we're going to sit, and we're going to start walking in the liberty and the power and the unity of oneness that Jesus walked in and came to demonstrate through the love of the Father. And I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Everything I said today, God will make it real to you and he'll bring it to your remembrance so you can know that we're, you're going to reshape your possibilities and reshape what you believe and redefine what faith is. God bless you. We will see you next time. We'll continue in faith and be not moved away from the hope that is set before you. We'll see you next time. Be blessed.